so the the registration has started so uh welcome again uh thank you Hello. for being here and feel free to start your presentation okay thank you very much i will share the screen yeah be sure to to share also the uh sound okay include computer sound okay do you see it yeah Okay, so I'll start. If there is an issue, just yes, let me know with the sound I mean. Hello, everybody. My name is Javier Bernas Alvarez. I'm a postgraduate teaching assistant at the University of Colonia. Uh, I'm a member of the integrated group for engineering research as well as research assistant at the University of Vienna. And I'm going to present you um, with my, our last paper entitled Unit 3D Based Simulation for Operations Management Chain Teaching. Uh, in collaboration with Diego Crespo Pereira, who is a professor at the University of Catalonia, as well as a member of the Integrated Group for Engineering Research. So, the outline of the presentation will be the next one, will be the following. We will start with a brief introduction, and we are talking about our 3D simulation game, game mechanics, and the goal of the user that uh, has to follow. And kind of proposed teaching activity based on the 3D simulation game we have developed, and some conclusions drawn up of, out of the uh, the development of this uh, research work. So starting with introduction, uh, we are actually, it's in question now that we are uh, witnessing a soaring use of discrete machine simulation as a decision support and planning tool. Uh, this is also confirmed by, by, by the recent advancements, for example, in commercial packages. And also, uh, this is being significantly enhanced uh, by the development of complementary technologies, for example, like Internet of Things, like data, cloud computing, uh, within the context with the frame of what we call Industry 4.0. Uh, we are actually talking, uh, here you're talking a lot about the digital twin paradigm concept, where, where this has uh, one of the main uh, roles. Uh, in this case, digital twin applied to manufacturing or warehousing systems. Uh, however, we, we have identified that in the case of current and future engineers uh, in this field of engineering, uh, they must acquire proper and modern simulation uh, skills in order for these models to be effective, to, for, in order for them to perform what we want them to perform and achieve what we want to achieve with them. Okay. Um, uh, in this case, the way to achieve uh, this is not very clear. Uh, there are many learning methodologies from classical lectures, project or test-based learning, uh, and we believe in game based learning combined with them, not just alone, but combined with them, uh, to be the key to uh, engaging, to motivating, to making students feel motivated at least, and actually acquire those skills they will need in the future. Uh, so that's why, that's, uh, that's the main reason why we have developed our simulation game. Uh, and that we have made them, uh, made it, sorry, uh, digital, instead of, for example, tabletop or role playing, role playing. because um, uh, otherwise it would be, for example, impossible to uh, immerse uh, very much students, uh, for example, in controlling a real system or visiting a manufacturing plant, that's the case that we have here today. Uh, so the possibilities that the, this digitalization of things offers is very attractive to accomplish the task I just said. So, um, talking about our 3D simulation game, I show you here two pictures of the main interface and the scenario that the user will face. Um, I must say first that uh, the game has been developed by means of Unity 3D, that is, which is a very famous game engine. Uh, it represents uh, the real manufacturing plant that uh, the user has to control. Actually, the user performs the operations manager role, and he will be in charge first. Uh, of sizing the workshop, that means deciding the different capacities of the different elements, as we can see in the first picture. Um, these capacities, the sizing, will have an impact on the score function. Okay? 
and afterwards he will actually perform that role I just said about operations manager by deciding, for example, when and how many items uh, to order, uh, when to uh, ship manufacturing orders, when to uh, deliver uh, the, um, the, the final product to customer, depending and according to the pending orders and the variability also inserted in that part of the, the game. Okay, so also the user has a specific static panel in the upper uh, right corner of the screen where he can follow, he can monitorize the time that has already passed and the profit, that is the score function as, as I will explain afterwards. Okay, uh, however, it's worth noting first how is the um, process flow that has been implemented. It consists of first, first the two lines of uh, providers and some inventory buffers uh, that uh, both of them convey to an assembler which will uh, assemble the two parts of the provider in a, a unique product. Um, then we have just a simple line of uh, different several processors, processors sorry, and conveyors to the final stock buffer that will uh, um, stock, will store the product uh, necessary to satisfy customer demands, customers' demands. Sorry, uh, we have also introduced um, variability in the process by means of uh, time distributions, uh, either on the provider or on the customer that follow both a uniform distribution, and then on the assembler and processor uh, for different processors with different uh, Poisson process processes to also, as I said, increase the variability and make the game a little bit more difficult, okay? Uh, going ahead to game mechanics, uh, first of all, uh, regarding the rules of the game, as I said, uh, the game has two different parts, time zero and once the simulation has started. At time zero, the player must decide, as I said, from the arrival buffer's capacity to the assembler and workstation process's capacities, and the final product buffer capacity. Each of them will have an impact on the score function, as I said. And then, once the simulation start, uh, starts, sorry, the players in charge of deciding mm, A and B items orders, manufacturing and shipment order, okay? And also the timing. They will be part of the key of the, to the game, of the teaching activity. So with this in mind, we describe here the profit function, which is the score function, and the aim of the user, in this case a student or the player, is to maximize it. Okay, it is based on a three component equation. Uh, first, the revenue, which is the price of products times the, uh, the quantity that has been shipped and demand by the customer. And then we have both fixed cost and variable costs, combining also concepts from business uh, management. Okay, uh, the fixed costs are decided at the beginning of the simulation, whereas the variable costs are being updated and increased and decreasing during the simulation depending on the user's decision. Okay, so uh, based on this game I have just explained on this application, we propose a teaching activity. This teaching activity is made up of four different sessions with more or less one hour and one hour and a half duration each session. Uh, from the first session, when we present the, uh, the user with the game, they can experience the first play, game plays, and they have to, they must understand clearly the rules and the goals. The second session, they will build a conceptual model uh, of the uh, game they just play in the first session. Okay, so the, the game we uh, delivered them uh, represents the real manufacturing plan, as I said before. We have, with this in mind, we have to measure task times and calculate distributions and as in the real project. And then in the, first, in the third session, they start to build a simulation model of this uh, manufacturing plan with a commercial package, for example. Uh, they have to validate it and define out of the results, out of the model they have developed, a decision strategy. In the final session, they will have to actually implement this strategy on the real, uh, on the game that they have, and uh, in the final gameplay, they will record the final score, which is automatically done by the application, and deliver this encrypted file to the professor. Uh, the professor, of course, will decide grading based on the results of the different students. Uh, here, for example, we um, show an example, an instance of a 3D model of the uh, game developed by a commercial package. 
So, as main conclusion, conclusion sorry, uh, apart from developing the game, uh, we believe uh, that through this kind of game-based uh, learning, uh, teachers can acquire those necessary skills on modeling simulation and operations managers, manager too far in the future, tackle real problems in an effective way. We also highlight the potential uh, these game-based activities to engage, to captivate the students, and finally, the potential of game engines to facilitate the development phase. Uh, also, by providing all these opportunities, uh, by connecting virtual reality, augmented reality, or uh, implementing the application on different devices such as laptops or tablets or phones. Okay. So that's all from my part. Uh, my last question is: You would run the game? You feel like you would run it? And I'm now available to any question or doubt you may have on our game. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thanks to the A3N organization for organizing this amazing conference. Okay, perfect. So thank you, Javier, for your uh, uh, presentation. And uh, I see already a question from, uh, I, I hope uh, I can read uh, the, the Greek language. Uh, I, I think the name is Athanasius. Uh, sure, correct. And, uh, please, Athanasius, if you want to uh, switch yes. on your camera and your mic, you can make yeah, the question directly. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Nice to meet you here. Uh, I would like to ask Javier, uh, do you use any modeling language in order to describe the flow? For example, a UML or PetriNet? Before uh, the implementation, no. I mean. Okay. No, actually, uh, I must say we first took an example from one of our lectures. Um, it was practically virtually straightforward implementation in Unity. We already had the code. We just decided, okay, let's do, let's think about a simple process that can be useful for a lecture, that can be also not so difficult to model because it's thought to for students that don't have that experience on, on modeling and simulation. And they have to, of course, simulate it with a commercial package, as I said. So it was more straightforward than using this kind of tools. Yeah, thank you, because we use uh, the same language uh, for our virtual lab. What do you mean with this? Unity. We use Unity ah, okay. in order to build a virtual lab for the students to make experiments. Yeah, actually, yes. Either in Coruña or in Genova, I'm using a lot of Unity. I'm still engineering, but I'm programming a lot. Okay. <laughs> and it's very, very useful to implement so many things and mix it, mix them with other more traditional tools. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Athanasius. I also have a very quick question, which is just a curiosity. Uh, so you're using the Unity 3D for, um, let me say, teaching purposes. Uh, so uh, it, it is very interesting. Uh, we also develop simulation models and uh, uh, virtual reality tools for uh, teaching. So uh, in your opinion, which, is, uh, which are the main characteristics that this kind of virtual reality tools should have in order to in maximize the uh, let me say the the learning uh, of, uh, from 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 the students in this case. So uh, you know because from one side uh, it is also very time consuming to to create this kind of uh, virtual reality tools and to to program as you said and uh, and so on and to make of course significant and valuable uh, tools for teaching. So. Uh, which are the minimum requirements for this kind of tools so that students can really learn in a significant way? Well, uh, re from my experience, I can say that first of all, the interface, the controllers must be straightforward, very clear. They don't have to lose time on, oh, how is this? Why is this not like this? We are now very used to cutting edge things from iPhone, Microsoft, Microsoft, etc. So, of course, we are not them. So, but when we are developing these kind of applications, I always focus on saying, okay, the controllers must be as simpler uh, as they can. Uh, 
Uh, and then regarding the models, uh, one of the most difficult things I would say from my experience is to measure the level of difficulty. Because if it's too difficult, it will not engage the students. At the beginning, they will be like, oh, come on, this is again, it's very different from anything, every, I mean, all the things we do normally. Yes, but if it's too difficult, at some time they will get tired and will say, okay, it's not engaging anymore. Uh, but also if it's too simple, they will say, okay, it's fine, oh, come on, it's beautiful, but it's, mm, it doesn't make sense to, to do this because it's too simple, okay? So level of difficulty, the interface, uh, and also, uh, well, I'm quite young, but uh, I think uh, when I was a student uh, and a professor came to, to the lecture with uh, an application, uh, regardless of uh, if it was more, uh, uh, I don't know, um, useful or not, it was like, come on, it's just new. So you, I, you call my attention, I'm going to pay attention much more than normal. So it's, I think it's positive from time to time, not abusing, of course, of these things, but from time to time to, to use this kind of means to captivate them. Yeah, 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 I totally agree. Thank you very much, Javier, again. And of course, uh, if the audience has some additional information, uh, they can reach you uh, through the, the different sessions in the chat and even later by email. So thank you again. And uh, now we can move to the second presentation. Uh, the second presentation is entitled Comparing a VR ship simulator using an HMD with a commercial ship handling simulator in a cave setup. The authors are uh, Ricky Leder and Mathis Laudan. And uh, uh, here we are. Uh, hi, Rick. Ricky. I, I guess the pronunciation is that this one or not? It's uh, hi, it's uh, Rike. Rike, OK, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, please feel free to start your um, presentation to share the screen and the audio and get us through your work. Hello, I'm Rika, and welcome to my presentation with the title Comparing a VR Ship Handling Simulator Using an HMD with a Commercial Ship Handling Simulator in a Cave Setup. The agenda for this presentation is in the beginning an introduction and motivation to this research, the user study with its findings, followed by the discussion, and lastly, I will conclude the research and give you an outlook. The motivation for this research is due to the importance of seafarers. With the still growing maritime traffic, which plays a central factor in modern global economy, a lot of seafarers are needed. In order to get the responsibility of a ship, a special education with a lot of training and experience is needed. Especially since a lot of accidents are caused by human failure. Today, onboard training is still thought to be the best way of practice and widely common. However, it is very expensive. Due to this, simulator training is getting more and more a valuable tool for the education in the maritime sector. The advantages of a simulator are the lower cost, the possibility to train and repeat dangerous situations while causing no harm to the crew, the ship or the environment. Also, such a simulator is more flexible than onboard training. Simulators can be very different. There are a lot of types like an AR simulator, a model simulation here, the MET models are best known, and bridge simulators. The bridge simulators are the most advanced maneuvering devices due to a full-scale mock-up of a ship's bridge, an out-of-window view, causing a high level of immersion, and already given standardized training procedures. Nevertheless, with the current state as a CAVE automatic virtual environment, a CAVE, the simulators are still very expensive, have high operating and maintenance cost, and need a lot of space due to the standardized copy of sophisticated bridge elements. With an HMD, the immersion is even higher, bigger virtual environments are possible, there are lower operating costs, it is more flexible and requires less space. In order to compare both setups, the cave shown in the left picture served as the model for the HMD, which is shown in the right picture. However, the main difference between both setups is the interaction. As the HMD setup needs VR glasses and its controllers, the interaction modalities alters to the cave setup. The cave has real bridge equipment, while the HMD equipment only exists as 3D models. 
SDHMD setup was built with Unity, the SteamVR add-on was used to make these 3D models interactable. Another difference is the projection. While the cave setup requires several projectors, the HMD setup needs only the VR glasses. Additional to the cave model, we added bridge rings to the HMD setup, but lowered the fidelity in hydrodynamics and ignored environmental influences like wind and water forces. And now I want to show you a short demo of our HMD setup. Rick, uh, we cannot hear the audio of the video if there is any, I don't know. No, I think I forgot the audio there. No problem. Maybe if you want to comment on this, feel free to do it. Yeah, uh, but it's almost over, so. Ah, OK. The user study followed a within subject design in order to compare both conditions directly with each other. During the study, we collected different kinds of data. On one hand, we collected quantitative data like a distance estimation, the task completion time, and the task load measured by the NASA TLX questionnaire. On the other hand, we collected qualitative data by observing the participants, getting feedback from a supervisor for each participant, and holding a semi-structure interview. Here, we wanted to find out information about the immersion and realism, possible difference in the interactions and performance, simulator preferences and annotations by the participants. The training scenario itself was created by the supervisor and is a normal scenario which is practiced by beginners and advanced, which requires the use of all bridge instruments and trains harbor entries exit, which are very complex navigational tasks with a high risk of collision. For the user study, we could acquire four students, all in higher semesters, but with very different onboard experience. We also could acquire one nautical science teacher from a university. On the left picture, you can see the study setup of the cage out of the instructor's room. On the right picture, there is the study HMD setup from the extended stay in room. The results for the user study are the following. For the quantitative results, the study shows that the distance estimation is equally poor in both setups. The task completion time was longer in the CAVE setup, but three out of four participants needed more time in the HND setup. Also, the task load was higher in the CAVE setup. For the qualitative results, we can say that the students behave differently between each other, but not between the simulators. We notice in particular that the interaction between the setup was very different. As the HMD setup misses haptic feedback for the bridge equipment, the participants always had to look down to the handles when to grab and adjust them. Also in the HMD setup, the students steered rather by sight due to the lower accuracy of the Agnes and radar. Yet it was stated that the HMD felt more realistic and immersed considering the possible usage of the bridge rings. For the situation awareness, the supervisor stated that only one person had a good situation awareness in the CAVE setup and another in the HMD setup. With these results, the students stated their preference at the end of the study. Two students preferred the CAVE setup, one would like to have a combination of both, and one would prefer the HMD setup. Lastly, the participants stated that they wish for more simulator time, and a supplementary simulator would be very helpful. In beforehand of the user study, we expected to have a higher task load in the HMD setup due to the unknown controls. However, the results show the opposite, which is reasoned by the lower sophisticated hydro and chip dynamics. Also against current research, we expected a better distance estimation in the HMD setup, as experts stated a higher level of immersion compared to the CAVE setup. 
the poor results are not clearly drawn back to the simulators, as we had no comparison data to the real-life estimations. Another interesting point is the supervisor, who was asked to act as normal as possible and have a usual training session. This includes also providing assistance at the right time, but led to variety in the experiment procedures. Also, the students had individual problems and performed differently, which caused also a variance in the runs. Especially one student had problems with the suggested birthing maneuver, causing a very long run. We could find out that the HMD setup can be used in educational purposes, like getting familiar with the bridge equipment, plotting and finding routes, staying on the fairway, learning and applying rules and laws, and improving awareness and decision making. Yet, our simulator is not comparable to the cave setup due to the physics and hydrodynamics, but with the bridge wings, proves a high immersion and a good help for birthing maneuvers. All in all, we can say that our setup as it is now is a good compound to the cave setup, with a higher immersion when steering by sight but lacks of accuracy in the ship's behavior. For the future work, there are two possibilities either a compound tool or a standalone tool. As a compound tool, there should be implemented a connection with the cave setup to draw on its advantages. Whereas for the standalone tool, the sophisticated physics, real actors and radar, several scenarios and the multi-user setup must be implemented by its own. Optional, different bridge setups can be added. This was my presentation. I thank you for your attention, and now I am open for your questions. Thank you very much, Rike, for uh, the presentation. Is there any question from the audience? Please feel free to raise your hand and switch on your camera and mic. In the meanwhile, I actually have a, a question. Uh, yeah. First of all, let me say that uh, we also work a lot with ship bridge simulators. Uh, we, are, uh, we have carried out a research project uh, uh, several years ago now, and uh, uh, we have developed now what is a, 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 re a real product that is commercialized on the market as ship bridge simulator. I'm just pasting the link here in the, in the chat if you are interested. Uh, uh, this is now commercialized, let me say, through our spin-off company of the University of Calabria. So you can uh, you can see that there are several functionalities from this point of view, and we also carried out similar uh, analysis and tested the, uh, the, the these setups uh, uh, like you, were, you, you like you did. Um, just a, a curiosity from the paper, reading the paper, I noticed that. Uh, regarding the uh, task load, uh, the NASA ta task load index, uh, the participants uh, uh, showed a lower uh, workload using the HMD compared to the cave environment. So this is quite uh, interesting because usually, you know, when people use uh, this kind of helmets, virtual reality helmets, they find they they find very difficult to work with with that with different functionalities. Uh, maybe they they have some issues uh, using them for too long time. So uh, and sometimes they report that it is better maybe a a huge uh, VR environment like a cave instead of uh, HMDs. So can you please say something about it? Or some maybe feelings you got from the participants? Yeah, I think uh, the participants stated that there was much more physics and hydrodynamics in the cave setup so maybe this caused the higher task load in there and the hmd we had one participant who i don't know uh, the person had to struggle a lot with the interactions and uh, had a really very long settling in period and was totally overwhelmed by the hmd interaction but on general, it seems like uh, the HMD setup was quite easy for the task load and you know, probably due to the uh, lower physics. OK, good. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, 
If there are no questions from the other participants, uh, thank you again, and uh, we can move to the next presentation. So the next presentation, according to the program, is uh, a real-time streaming-based VR scenario construction method for the simulation of complex products. Uh, I don't know if the speakers are connected. Is anyone from the speak from the authors of this paper connected to the session? I think there is no one. So it's a no show. Uh, so we can move to the next one uh, in the meanwhile. Uh, Virtual, the next um, presentation, the next paper is Virtual Reality System for Training in the Detection and Solution of Failures in Induction Motors. Uh, is any one of the authors also here? I think those two papers uh, were in the program, but we, we had some issues with the authors, maybe due to the time slot. Excuse me, are you still showing their presentation or, or not? No, because they actually uh, did not send the presentations. Oh, OK. So uh, indeed, th this is why uh, we uh, were just saying that this is probably a no show. Uh, they didn't send the, the video presentations and it seems that they are not available for presenting. So yeah, we can maybe move to the uh, next one, to the fifth, which is uh, use of virtual reality for training on procedures in an intensive care unit during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Hali Asghari is here, so I can... Uh, hi. Uh, so uh, we can uh, uh, start the presentation. Let me know if you need any help. Do I need to do anything myself? Uh, as you want, I can start the presentation myself or you can do it. Uh, yes, please do it. I, if, if you can. Yeah, sure. Just give me one second. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let me start sharing. So, do you see the screen? I see the screen, but nothing in it yet. Yeah, yeah, now let me just click play. Good morning, yeah. good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning to this session. Uh, my name is Ali Asgeri. I'm from York University Disaster and Emergency Management Program and Advanced Disaster Emergency and Rapid Response Simulation. I'm very glad to be presenting to you uh, one of the projects that we have been involved uh, during the past few months is, uh, in collaboration with University Health Network, uh, University of Toronto. Uh, over uh, and related to developing a virtual reality application for COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, training in the ICU units. Uh, we started this uh, project uh, early in the pandemic, uh, the first phase of pandemic. And of course, since then, uh, things have changed uh, significantly.
the research team basically consists of uh, a number of researchers uh, from uh, different backgrounds, uh, some from medical uh, science and um, with medical uh, professional uh, activities and uh, some from uh, different disciplines uh, in different departments. Um, and also the research team included a number of uh, postdoctoral fellows and uh, research assistant and research associates, uh, all linked to uh, each of these, uh, each of the team members. Uh, and we have been collaboratively working uh, on this project. We had uh, regular weekly by weekly meetings uh, during our research period. And uh, through this, we basically work together uh, to set the framework, uh, design the idea, and develop the application and uh, make it ready for testing. We followed the basic uh, principles of developing an, uh, a virtual reality application. We started, of course, with uh, needs assessment. Uh, and followed some uh, design ap application design uh, process uh, and developed the application uh, and make it, made it ready for testing. Um, that is the phase we are at right now. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, this process as well as uh, some of the basics of uh, developing the 3D uh, environment of our uh, IC model. Uh, particularly focusing on the development of our uh, patient model uh, that we spent some time in, in developing it. And uh, a little bit of uh, snapshot presentation of the procedures that we, uh, we created uh, for our virtual reality application. Now, uh, obviously uh, we had to, before we begin, we had to find out which procedures uh, are conducted in an ICU environment. Uh, the virtual reality application uh, group were not familiar uh, with, the, with these procedures. So they had to uh, meet and talk and work closely with the medical team to uh, first uh, identify and then understand and uh, then classify uh, these procedures. So to classify them, uh, we, we try to understand which procedures in the ICU uh, are more important for, um, for the type of virtual reality application that we, we wanna develop. So we developed certain, uh, a number of six uh, criteria uh, to basically find out uh, which procedures are most critical and important. By the way, I should have mentioned that there were uh, we identified about 13 activity and procedures uh, conducted by different staff members in the ICU for a patient or, or on a patient. So uh, these 13 were not all of them necessary for uh, being included in the virtual reality application. So this process was done really to figure, figure that out. Uh, using criteria such as frequency of the use uh, of the procedure, we mean, and significance of the procedure, training impacts, and COVID-19 risk mitigation uh, elements, whether this uh, procedure can be used before, beyond uh, the ICU and beyond COVID. These were our criteria. Using this criteria and applying uh, an AHP uh, method, we came up with these results. Basically, these three uh, key um, were found to be the key procedures like donning and doffing and respiratory uh, support. These are uh, the ones that we selected for developing our virtual reality applications uh, or give the priority to them. Not that we, we did not do the rest, but we gave priority to this. And now for the, uh, for the other parts where we, we needed to build this virtual reality based on uh, an environment, we decided to select one of the IC rooms in one of the hospitals, Toronto General Hospital, and build the 3D model according to that model. I mean, this, this is not necessary, but we figured, we, we found it is probably making more uh, connection between the user and, uh, and, the, and the 3D model that we are uh, developing. And this is the whole uh, IC ward in the hospital. And we selected this room that was larger room for our virtual reality application. 
Now, in uh, another aspect of this project was basically to develop uh, a 3D uh, and um, active, uh, I would say, uh, patient. Uh, for which we, we needed to develop a patient that, first of all, uh, can show elements of COVID uh, virus spread. Uh, so we built uh, a function that uh, uses the existing data to, uh, to show the, the spread of virus uh, on different situations, whether, for example, with mask, with mask, without mask, and also under normal breathing or uh, sneezing or um, coughing, etc. And also the, the uh, sort of animation um, of, the, of the agent, of the, the patient, so that it reacts and respond to, uh, to interactions with the, uh, with the nurse and whoever is uh, conducting that procedure. Also, because this is a training tool, we uh, we wanted to have a navigation system in it, uh, built in it, so that users can, when they enter, they can register, uh, and also they can choose from uh, different procedures. Uh, currently, these two pro main procedures, and then do uh, their practice or uh, learning exercise uh, or actual test. Uh, by selecting each of these options, they go through the the, the, uh, the, the procedures they have to uh, do. Uh, for example, if they choose task, then uh, they have to make sure that they follow the, the rules and uh, uh, conduct the procedures according to the rules. If they don't, they will be uh, receiving uh, low score for their uh, experiment. Uh, so as I said, this uh, creating all these in virtual reality wasn't uh, really uh, uh, easy, uh, especially when you're uh, uh, when, when the user is the first person and also wants to see uh, what he or she is doing. So we created a kind of mirroring avatar so that person who is uh, doing all these uh, donning and doffing and activities in the ICU can see themselves in a mirror. Uh, for example, when I, as a first person, wear uh, face mask, I should be able to see that I have actually worn my face mask. That, that was the reason we created this. And so this, this enables you basically to follow the res, uh, through these processes uh, using all these uh, elements in the, in the donning uh, process. Uh, we also did this uh, for intubation process, as you can see here. Again, intubation process uh, needs to follow certain uh, activities and in order. And so this, uh, this procedure also has its own specifications. Uh, we developed obviously the equipments that are, uh, that can be, um, can react to uh, nurse or uh, who are conducting the procedure uh, as they uh, pick up different uh, components. Uh, they can move them, they can assign them, they can attach them, they can remove them. Uh, in, of course, uh, this has to be in order. Uh, and the testing works like this, that if, uh, if the person is not conducting, for example, each of these procedures in uh, incorrect way, it gives them some warning or at the end of the exercise or test, it gives them some uh, the score that is lower if they, were, if they are not following uh, the exact procedure. And I would like also to thank you, our uh, funding agencies, uh, including Toronto General Hospital uh, through UHN, York University, Public Health Agency of Canada, and Ontario Research Fund, and CIHR, that is Canadian Funding Agencies for Health Research, and also Advanced Disaster and Emergency Response Simulation at York University. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, so let me just close the video sharing. Okay, so thank you, Ali, for the very interesting presentation on a uh, critical topic that today, unfortunately, is seeing all of us, you know, uh, completely involved and uh, 
we hope this situation even in the hospitals for the uh, people uh, working there is uh, ending soon but of course this technology uh, will be uh, always uh, uh, appreciated and useful uh, i can see a sort of question from john richardson uh, saying air filtration i don't know if john wants to say something please feel free to switch on your camera and mic yeah um what i was wondering about uh, you have that little green circle that's the uh whatever the uh, uh spread of the particles and things like that uh did you uh that seems like it's a simple model. Did you consider things like air filtration? Um, you know, uh, how many times you uh, filter the air out of the room six times, uh, which I think is kind of recommended. But uh, um, did you ever do that or whatever? Uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for the good question. Um, the, the current model inside this uh, application is based on existing literature and it really covers mostly uh, virus spread um, using normal breathing, coughing and sneezing. It does not include any air filtrations and uh, you know complicated uh, issues related to uh, virus spread. However, in another study, we are working as a separate uh, later on, we may include this into this study, but in another study, we are now examining uh, kind of more detailed um, viruses spread using airflow and also, you know, uh, basically uh, dynamics of, uh, you know, airflow in it, in both uh, uh, open space and um, sort of closed spaces. Uh, and hoping to actually include that into this study. But currently it is using base, very base model, as you said, uh, just to show uh, for the users how uh, exposed they may be, uh, depending on their distance with the patient for now. It's not as real as or as detailed as, as it should be. I, uh, I also have a question on the uh, virtual environment. Uh, uh, it's got flat textures. Uh, do you have uh, any any uh, uh, photos that you add textures to? In other words, to make it well. I mean, in case the room had Hello Kitty things all over it. I mean, you know. Uh, absolutely yes. Actually, we initially designed the room exactly looking like the the real room with all those even uh, you know flyers you know, posters and everything uh, around it. But uh, later on, we, we removed some of this stuff uh, basically to to reduce the load uh, issue that we had, especially using uh, Oculus uh, independent of the action of any computer. So uh, for that, and even for the initial model we had uh, included the whole IC ward. And again, to, to minimize the size, we, we try to reduce also, uh, reduce it to just one room and one hall. But very good point, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, was it Unity that you're using or what modeling tool did you produce the uh, VR in? Uh, we use basically uh, Unity, but uh, to prepare materials for Unity, we of course use other you know, 3D uh, software tools to, for example, generate the uh, the animation and also the, the 3D models of each items, etc. But down, you know, for the engine, it was Unity only, yes. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very informative talk. Thank you. Thank you, John, for the questions and thank you, Ali, for the very nice work. Thank you. So we can move to the last presentation then, uh, which is reducing dangers within industrial plants by extended reality. Uh, the presenter, the speaker should be Antonio Giovanetti. Uh, yes. we... Good morning, everyone.
Hi, hi, Antonio. Feel free to share your video. Okay, I'm going to share my. Okay, one moment, please. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, uh, actually, yeah. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Antonio Giovannetti, member of simulation team, University of Genoa. And today I'm going to show you the project entitled Reducing Dangers Within Industrial Plants by Extended Reality. The goal of this project is the creation of an interactive environment representing dangerous areas, such as confined spaces, in order to improve preparation of operators and to reduce risk factors and accidents. In addition, we studied the use of artificial intelligence in joint connection with immersive, interoperable cyber physical system, uh, including a wearable solution, in order to increase the perception and the ability to contribute to the management and control of the process. Thanks to the fast developments in software and hardware fields, nowadays new opportunities to create advanced technologies, tools to support personnel arise every day. Extended reality, which includes mixed reality, virtual reality and augmented reality, represent the best tool for an immersive experience and to train operators constantly and in a safe way without risk to damage working equipment or be injured. It is very common for industrial operators to manage with dangerous goods or to work in a risky environment. For instance, in some industrial plants, there are many confined spaces in which the storage of dangerous goods represent a real hazard for human safety. The risk of accidents is often associated with the incorrect storage of dangerous, uh, dangerous substances. There are several world-famous examples of these accidents that have gained worldwide fame for the number of injuries, costs, and environmental damage. Some of these accidents are the Union Carbide in uh, Bothell, uh, in Toulouse, the refinery in Texas City, uh, Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico, and last but not least, the Beirut explosion. Uh, with a large amount of uh, ammonium nitrate stored at the port of Beirut that caused uh, uh, over 200 deaths and 7,000 injuries and uh, $50 billion uh, in property damage. But there are also many minor, minor industrial uh, accident that every year involving operators that can cause more or less serious injuries. Many reviews of the literature indicate that the main cause of accidents at work in industrial process uh, is the incorrect handling of the process units by the operator. Many of these accidents are caused by the inexperience of the operator or paradoxically by the over self-confidence of the most experienced workers. Some studies mention that accidents occur and reoccur in the process industry because of the inefficient use of information and the lack of learning from the lessons that are available from accident data. Indeed, it is important to use the large amount of data from past accidents in order to constantly train plant operators. For these reasons, this research focuses on testing of innovative solutions and techniques for different applications, such as improvement of safety of operation, boost of performance and efficiency, and even to support supervision and maintenance for industrial production line using extended reality. The study focuses on confined space that represent high-risk environment. 
this simulation tool should be integrated in a low-cost solution such as smartphone or a virtual reality device. In this way, the user is trained to face a dangerous situation safety while still living a realistic experience. Indeed, it is important to recreate unexpected factors. In this case, the use of artificial intelligence and intelligent agents is crucial to reproduce real actions and reactions of the players within the scenario, such as operators, competitors, external threats, internal threats, coordinators, and supervisors that be uh, that by dynamically perceiving the, the status of the situation and reacting to it, determine the evolution of the system. These intelligence agents should be interoperable with the different models that compose the virtual environment without any pre-established schemes in order to guarantee flexibility and composability of the proposed approach. Intelligent agents are a crucial element to provide the user with the possibility to live a realistic experience within the virtual world, in which the stimuli are not always the same, but change based on boundary condition, evolution, and human player actions and decisions. The use of artificial intelligence and the large amount of data available thanks to advanced control systems and numerous sensors in many production lines allows us to study a possible way to create a smart control system. In this way, it could be possible to control the operations in real time and to predict and optimize many aspects of the industrial processes, facts that turn even more critical when dealing with dangerous environments. With advancements in industrial Internet of Things, the capability to gather large amounts of data, big data, and the rise of artificial intelligence Virtual reality has become a crucial point to integrate distributed systems in order to develop solutions for monitoring, tracking, and maintaining in industrial plants and to support operations on them. Thanks to big data and machine learning algorithms, it turned possible to create smart machines that synchronize with the real operations and processes at any time, providing a clear understanding of the current past and possible future situations. Sensors constantly send signals on the status of equipment to the control room. The large amount of data not only allows to alert in real time if there is a failure, but can create a predictive model able to alert in advance whether or not a failure will occur. The operator on the spot, thanks to the wearable solution through augmented reality, is coordinated directly by the highly specialized staff in the control room. In order to create this complex and flexible model for all proposed solutions, it is necessary to develop a support architecture that is able to integrate the various devices, information, models, and wearable technologies. Because of the central role of big data, it is necessary to set up a data acquisition and exchange system that is fast, efficient, and flexible. To reach this goal, it is proposed to create a centralized database which stores and saves data and periodically retrieves them from the server and sent to the client. The server, therefore, also performs analysis of the data and the elaboration in order to create the prediction model, the predictive model, and to send alert and corrective actions. Another important aspect is to guarantee security because of the sensitive data. In order to reach this goal, it is possible for the server to access to some parts of the production line through a read-only access. This solution, with the addition of a firewall, reduces the possibility of unexpected intrusions. This study proposes an interactive multifunctional environment devoted to train and support operators in their activities in dangerous areas. The project shows the possibility of integration of modern mobile and wearable technologies in the production line. Feature reviews and past data show us how many accidents are the result of low experience or absence of training of the operators, or how we still, still do not notice the signals that alert us to a faction. Availability of large amounts of data makes it, makes it necessary to use new, simple, and low cost solutions capable of integrating and processing a lot of information. Thanks to the relation between modeling simulation and artificial intelligence, 
it is possible to create predictive model identify synergies with available information system and to integrate data in modern plants in order to improve efficiency and safety. The complexity of these systems and the related data could get a great benefit by using effectively the new capabilities uh, provided by reference technologies really related to extended reality, virtual and augmented reality in combined ways, and the concepts and advancement within the immersive technologies such as Oculus or HoloLens and other full range of interactive devices. Thanks for the attention. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Yeah, John. So, what do you uh, <coughs> what do you use for the uh, the big data processing? Use uh, C, C++, or you roll your own, or do you use like MATLAB or or some other uh, uh, data acquisition system? Or but for data acquisition elaboration, principally uh, Python. Uh, uh, we developed in in the past uh, some machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms to process these types of, di of data. So uh, when the um, the availability of these algorithms. So it's it's like PyTorch or whatever the, the yes the, yes the yes yes big data. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, smart machines. How do you get the data in? If there's a, if there's a, a a trillion bits per femtosecond or something like that, you know. Yeah. Nowadays, mm, thanks to Thanks to the, the sensors of, of a lot of, mach of um, in the machines, we we can um, extract the data directly, such as uh, the, the temperature or uh, um, uh, I don't know the, the the movements, the degree of freedom of, of a machine in an industrial plant, and we can pr process it and create the, the predictive model uh, in order to extract the real information. OK, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for the questions and the remarks. Uh, is there any other question? So, OK, I think there are no more questions. I actually have one question, but it's not for the uh, authors. It's for uh, the session chair. Uh, yeah. I'll be presenting a paper later on today. Uh, yeah. um, and uh, do the session chairs uh, present the, uh, the MP4 video or uh, do you prefer that I just turn loose the MP4 video on my on my computer? It, it doesn't bother me, but you know, I'm just curious. I think you you can start the video on your own, uh, but it depends on the on the chair of the session. So maybe sure. if you, if you can uh, uh, join the session a few minutes before the the start, maybe you can just uh, make this question to the to the chair of that session and uh, uh, he will definitely uh, help you and answer your question better than me maybe yeah um but also this uh, session is from 2 p.m to 3 30 to est which i believe in california is uh, 5 to 6 30 a.m or whatever but it, it's uh it is it is about three o'clock right and in, in yes. the cest yeah okay i just was, didn't want to you know uh eat a donut while i uh you know and miss my uh uh 30 minutes of fame or something like that okay then yeah. thanks very much starting from now there should we should have one hour break uh,
so sessions uh, will start again in uh, one hour. Uh, unfortunately, the other speakers are not present, uh, so we have to close this session. I would like to thank everybody for the very interesting presentations and uh, the questions uh, that made the, the sessions pretty the session pretty pretty interesting and animated. So I uh, just want you to invite to the next uh, sessions uh, this afternoon, uh, of course, you, uh, Central European uh, summertime and uh, to the special sessions also. So uh, feel free to give a look at the program and see which one uh, is more interesting for you unless you have to present uh, any paper. Thank you again, everybody, and uh, hope you will enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye. Thank you, Antonio. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Goodbye and enjoy the uh, day. You too. You too. Bye.